Morbius was filmed three years ago and has been put off so many times that I actually thought the April 1st, 2022 release date was going to be an April Fool's Day joke and that this movie did not exist. But unfortunately, it does exist. It's here. Let's talk about the problem with Morbius. Hi everybody, I'm Oliver the Ricketts, and if you don't know, I love Spider-Man. The property is very important to me, and I've made tons of videos talking about that. You should also know that I hate the Sony Pictures universe of Marvel characters, aka the Spunk. And one of the main reasons that I hate the Spunk is that in the history of Sony owning Spider-Man, they have such a history of taking as many ideas as possible and throwing them at the wall and seeing what sticks. There has never been a comprehensive attempt at a Spider-Man franchise from Sony. Typically, they put out one or two really solid movies and then some terrible sequels attempting to build to something much bigger than what they can actually chew on. I've seen them do this many times. First example being the Raimi trilogy. They tried to go too big on Spider-Man 3. The attempt at the Amazing Spider-Man franchise with the first movie being very good and then Amazing Spider-Man 2 being a trailer for a Sinister Six movie that never happened. How many men did you have in mind? I want to keep it small. And even though I hate Venom, you can make the argument that both Venom films were crowd pleasers that people liked. But now we're here at Morbius, and this is why I was so worried. The Morbius marketing campaign showed a ton of Spider-Man Easter eggs in every trailer but not specific to one Spider-Man. What was so concerning about the Morbius trailers was that it showed Easter eggs from every live action Spider-Man universe Sony has ever put on screen. This included an image of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire, the Oscorp building from the Amazing Spider-Man franchise, and of course, Michael Keaton playing the Vulture in the trailers, who is in Spider-Man Homecoming. That's the guy. And so given Sony's record of trying everything and not having a plan, I was both curious and nervous to see what they were going to do with Morbius when these trailers dropped. In fact, I think everybody was. Those Easter eggs made these trailers a huge talking point on the internet, which is amazing when you consider that at the time they were being released, the biggest Spider-Man movie of all time was also being released, and Morbius was still part of the conversation and not being overshadowed. However, as nervous as I was about what Sony was going to do with Morbius, there was part of me that was also cautiously optimistic. Although I've disliked both Venom films, I did think Venom Let There Be Carnage was a step in the right direction from Venom. There just was a lot more to go before I could call any of it a good movie. And while I had tons to say about how much I didn't like Venom, my main issue with those movies was that Spider-Man was not in it. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and state the obvious. There's no Spider-Man in this. Even though he was so integral to Venom's character. But the thing about Morbius is that unlike Venom, he's just a guy that fights Spider-Man. His origin is not really tied up with Spider-Man other than that he appears in that comic book. He's fought other superheroes. He's been his own character. So if you were ever going to do a Spider-Man-less Spider-Man universe movie, Morbius was a better bet than Venom. I think the main issue with the concept of this Morbius movie is that Morbius is both crazy and hyper-violent in the comics. His first appearance, he brutally murders a ship full of people, and he fights a Spider-Man with six arms on the cover. This was not a character that was ever going to work in a run-of-the-mill, by-the-numbers, PG-13 movie. The main sin of this movie is that it is extremely boring. It does not feature anything nearly as interesting as Spider-Man having six arms. But all the background information that I had of Morbius and my preconceived notions aside, let's get into judging this movie on its own merits. I always like to start my reviews with a quick list of positives. I try to be as fair as possible so that I can give you a real honest opinion and I don't come off as biased. Even when I reviewed Venom Let There Be Carnage, which I ultimately gave a D plus slash C minus undecided, I did start that video with a solid minute or two of things that I really liked about that movie. So I'm gonna try that here. First and foremost, this movie is short. I'm very grateful that there is still somebody making comic book movies that knows they don't need to be two and a half hours or even three hours. Sometimes a movie can work really well at 
an hour and a half like Venom Let There Be Carnage, or an hour and 44 minutes like Morbius. Unfortunately, this is not one of those times. Although Morbius is short in its runtime, it does feel like it goes on for four hours. It is so dull and so bland that an hour and 44 minutes was honestly too much for what they were doing with this movie. And beyond this, not to be hyperbolic, but there are not a lot of other positives to mention about Morbius. This movie is both completely contrived and entirely nonsensical. Anybody who has seen a movie or even read the concept of what a movie is will be able to predict every twist and turn that happens throughout the runtime of Morbius. There are two vampires arguing for over an hour. That's it. That's the whole movie. And sometimes a simple film can really work. Venom Let There Be Carnage had a very simple concept that I thought worked for what the movie was trying to be. The problem is more that there are no characters to latch onto in this film. Morbius himself is a villainous, cold-blooded killer. And that can totally work. There are plenty of great movies and TV shows about bad people who kill people where you like the main character. The problem is this movie does not commit to that angle because they still want Morbius to be a hero even though he's acting like a villain. But it's somewhat implied that maybe the people he kills deserve it. However, Sony also doesn't know how they feel about that, so the people that Morbius kills also might just be fine people. We don't know. There is no definitive evidence that anybody Morbius kills deserve to die. And therefore, there is no definitive evidence that I should be rooting for Michael Morbius at any point in this movie. The way Sony gets past this is they make the antagonist of the film even worse. The villain of the movie does kill people, good and bad, and he is, on paper, worse than Morbius. But they made him so evil that he's actually really annoying. There is no lead in this movie to latch onto for you to like and root for. One positive that I have heard other reviewers saying about this movie is that at least there's some nicely framed action. And I would say, where? Morbius is moving very fast in this movie. They convey this with this very early 2000s effect of making everything blurry and at the same time kind of having pieces of Morbius' skin flying off so you can't really see what's happening. The best way I can describe it is it's very similar to the fast motion effect from Twilight. But keep in mind, Twilight came out in 2008, and honestly, although the effect is also bad there, there's some kind of charm about it in those movies that is completely lacking here. Right, they're just doofy. You know? The other issue is that all of the action sequences are incredibly dark, the camera is completely shaky, and as I alluded to before, there's a bunch of CGI particle effects getting in the way of actually seeing what's happening, likely to keep the movie PG-13. So most of the time when people are fighting, you just can't tell what's happening at all. One of the few positives about the Venom films is that Tom Hardy's performance does save them just a little bit. And honestly, a performance like that probably would have done wonders for this movie. Nobody stands out. Everybody is playing things as safe and as dull as they possibly can. Matt Smith's performance is the closest one to actually being something. Um, and you can tell they're going for a comically evil, cartoony villain kind of thing. But in a movie that is so dull, that's completely afraid to push the envelope and won't actually let him be that cartoon that he wants to be, this comes off as more annoying than anything else. If I did have to pick two standout performances from this movie, again using that term loosely, I would have to go with Tyrese and Al Madrigal. And it's not because of the caliber of their performance, it's because they are hilariously out of place. They play two detectives investigating Michael Morbius. And the thing is, they play it so hilariously deadpan for how ridiculous the movie is being. We're not in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where there are superheroes all the time and supernatural things happen. The only supernatural thing that has happened in the Sony Pictures universe of Marvel characters, aka the Spunk, is that Venom is there. I don't think most of the police officers or law enforcement in the story have seen supernatural elements yet. 
but I must be wrong. There's a scene very early on in the movie where these two detectives are investigating a murder conducted by Dr. Michael Morbius. And Al Madrigal's character is looking at the dead bodies and sees the two fang marks on the necks of each one. Now a real life detective maybe would say, oh, someone has a really pointy knife. But Al Madrigal jumps right to, oh, I think a vampire did this. A vampire. And I don't know what's funnier, the fact that he goes there and is so dead insistent that he's hunting a vampire, or the fact that he's right. A smarter movie, and a movie that was more self-aware, would have played this up for laughs. Staying on performances, I saved the best or worst for last, and that's Jared Leto surprising nobody. And this could be my own personal bias talking, because as a complete side tangent, I am finding it harder and harder to support Jared Leto in any capacity. First of all, his behavior on the set of Suicide Squad was completely unprofessional. He also has a very troublesome dating record, which I'm not going to get into here because I would like this video to not get shadow banned, um, but I do encourage you to look that up. It's very disturbing. And you can't convince me that he's not running a cult. Look at this guy. So it's very difficult to support him. And if I wasn't already invested in this franchise, I probably wouldn't have seen this movie. And it is kind of too bad because I've seen and love Dallas Buyers Club. I know Jared Leto can turn in a good performance. It's just that he usually doesn't. Lately, his performances have been the most bland interpretation of a character that seems like they're cut out of an early 2000s movie, uh, but they have that pretentious air that Jared Leto has that makes him so punchable. That's completely true for this. There is nothing remarkable about what he does here. He is sleepwalking through the entire performance, and at the end of the day, anybody could have turned in the same performance for this character that Jared Leto did, you could have had any actor in the lead role and there would have been no difference. The other major issue with this movie is it's a horrible case of false advertising. Like I said at the beginning, one of the main things people were looking forward to or at least curious about this movie for was the abundance of Easter eggs promised in the trailers. And I'm sure most people will be upset to find out that none of the things they promised in the trailer are in this movie. In fact, I'm pretty sure that those scenes were never in the movie and that they were shot specifically to be in this trailer to trick people into talking about this thing because Sony knew how boring, bland, and unremarkable it was. Another big thing being promised in these trailers was that Michael Keaton was going to come back and reprise his role as the Vulture. What's up, Doc? First of all, that would have been great. Michael Keaton's an excellent actor, and that character is a fan favorite. Michael Keaton does not show up in this movie before the credits roll. There are no trailers that do not feature him. He has a scene in every trailer, and all of those scenes are not here. And what sucks the most about that is that Michael Keaton could act circles around anybody who shows up in this movie, and even if his inclusion didn't make sense, he would have elevated this piece significantly. So why did they do it? This is a phenomenon that I call the Sony of it all, and it really comes down to what's going on in the post credit scenes of this movie. In lieu of all of the Easter eggs in the main runtime of the movie, Sony has included two terrible post credit scenes that are supposed to get us excited for what they do next with Spider-Man and his universe. I'm gonna give a quick rundown of what these scenes are, just so that what I'm talking about here makes sense. In the first post credit scene, a purple rift appears in the sky over New York that is the same one as the one from No Way Home. Michael Keaton shows up in an empty jail cell and looks right at the camera and says, I hope the food is better in this joint. A news report is shown saying that Michael Keaton's character, Adrian Toomes, didn't commit any crimes in this universe, only in the Marvel universe that he's been transported from, and he is going to be let out of prison. Then it goes back to credits for two seconds before we get our second post credit scene. In this scene, Morbius, who is shown multiple times in this movie with the ability to fly, is driving a car. He stops in an open field and Adrian Toomes drops down in his vulture costume from Spider-Man Homecoming. The helmet is never lifted, but Michael Keaton does do the voiceover. He says to Morbius, I don't know how I got here, but it has something to do with Spider-Man, I bet. It seems like a couple of guys like you and I should team up. I've been reading on you. 
let's try to do some good. And Morbius says, intriguing. And that's it. Clearly, this is an attempt from Sony to build the Sinister Six. And I have to say, as a longtime Spider-Man fan, this is the worst attempt at a Sinister Six that I have ever seen in my life. It's just that so much of this does not make sense. Let's start with cutting Michael Keaton from the film to insert him in this post credit scene. What made Vulture interesting in Spider-Man Homecoming was that even though he was evil, his story was also tragic. It was sad when Spider-Man sent him to jail. He cared about his daughter, who was another character that during Spider-Man Homecoming, we were made to care about. So this character showing up in this universe and being let out of prison, it's a violation of what the story was for this character when you don't even have him mention his daughter. Secondly, the rules here don't make sense. Spider-Man No Way Home shows a spell being made by Doctor Strange, which takes characters who know Peter Parker is Spider-Man out of their universes and puts them into the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Spider-Man. What it doesn't do is take characters out of the Marvel Universe and put them elsewhere. It wasn't a mishmash. That's not how the spell works. Spider-Man No Way Home actually had some really tight logic explaining how the spell worked, and now they're just changing that, and it doesn't make any sense. When he says the line, this has something to do with Spider-Man, I bet, the Spider-Man Michael Keaton knew in Spider-Man Homecoming was 15 or 16 years old. The Vulture truly believes that Spider-Man only stopped him because he had help from Tony Stark. So assuming that he jumped to a different dimension because of Spider-Man is a huge leap. Another huge leap is him teaming up with Morbius to get back at Spider-Man. In the context of this movie, Morbius is seen as a murderer. But when Michael Keaton meets Morbius, he says, I've been reading up on you, we should team up. So we're made to believe that Michael Keaton is angry at Spider-Man, and he's decided that he should send a murderous vampire after him. But the very last appearance we saw of him in Spider-Man Homecoming, we saw Scorpion, who worked with Michael Keaton during that film, asking who Spider-Man was, and Michael Keaton deciding that it wasn't fair to give Peter Parker's identity to another person who would go after him, even though this was a person he knew and might have trusted. Sony has taken everything that worked about Michael Keaton as the Vulture and kind of ruined it. And that's the biggest problem with what Sony does with the Spider-Man property. They're more concerned with what they are going to do next how things are going to fit together, and forcing that connection in a very rushed fashion. They don't care about what their characters are or who they are in the movie, why people like those characters, and a lot of the times it seems like they themselves have not watched their own films. The reason Sinister Six works as well as it does in the comics is that it's six people who believe that they have been wronged by Spider-Man teaming up against him. This Sinister Six would be taking place in a universe that so far does not include Spider-Man. And even if Spider-Man does exist in this universe in the background, he is not part of Venom's story so far, or Morbius's story so far. And I'm assuming they'll both be in the Sinister Six. Instead of having a group of people who have legitimate beef with Spider-Man making the conflict interesting, you just have six guys with superpowers who've decided, you know what, I hate that guy, I think. I can't wait to meet him. My one hope, truly, is that Andrew Garfield is not included as this universe's Spider-Man. He's above this. I'll give the next one a shot, but to be honest with you, I'm getting to the end of my rope. And even though I'm a lifelong Spider-Man fan that loves to see anything in the Spider-Man universe happen, if it continues in this way, I'm going to stop wasting my money on seeing these movies. And that's because Sony do not care about the fans. They want to make a quick buck and they see how valuable Spider-Man is, but they have not taken the time still after all of these years to understand what people like about this IP. I'm going to give Morbius an F minus. I will never watch this film again and I cannot wait to stop thinking about it. But if you want to judge Morbius for yourself, I have included the link to the digital version of Morbius 
in the description from Amazon. This is an Amazon affiliate link, so if you click on it and you buy Morbius, I do get a cut of that sale. Or if you click on it and you buy something else on Amazon, I also get a cut of that sale. It really helps the channel and what I'm doing here as a content creator that's doing this all on their own, and as I've established, wasting a lot of money on subpar Spider-Man films. I really, really appreciate the contribution. But if you wanna support for free, you can also hit that subscribe button, which lets you know when I make new videos and just does a lot to support this channel and the way that it's growing. If you wanna see something a little bit more positive, check out my Batman review or my review of Spider-Man No Way Home, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching.